to education, human rights, social justice, and economic development opportunities for women and youth. She is a member of the Harvard University think tank on global education and direct, direct an international working group with the World Council on Intercultural and Global Competence. Ms. Butler's contribution to global citizenship and the SDGs have led to cross-cultural collaboration opportunities for youth organization in Ghana, Nicaragua, Nigeria, Uganda, and the United States. She has been a presenter at many national and international conferences, including the United Nations General Assembly and the Commission on the Status of Women Conferences, as well as the Coalition Opposed to Violence and Extremism in partnership with her local human rights office. She holds a Master of Science degree in Adult Education and Human Resource Development and is currently a doctoral candidate for the degree of Doctor in Education in Higher Education and Adult Learning. Welcome, Sasha. Thank you. Thank you Amat, for that warm introduction. And I wanna welcome everyone. I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm sure you will agree that today's collaboration with these remarkable institutions is a fitting tribute to the importance of women's rights. Before we begin our virtual couch conversation, I'd like to introduce our esteemed speakers tonight and this morning and this afternoon. Charles Allen is the Director of Partnerships with the Institute for Economic and Peace. The partners are strategic and grassroots inclusive of governments, non-government organizations, education organizations, civil society organizations, service groups, and other institutes. Through partnerships, he is activating IEP's positive peace framework globally. In his previous role with Victoria Police Australia, he led strategic and operational change shifting policing to better adopt community engagement. He is well respected among peace builders for his pioneering work in resilience and equally respected within policing for his community centered approach to police management. He was recently awarded the Australian Police Medal, a division of Order of Australia for his service to, to, for the service to the community of Victoria, Australia. Next, we have Patricia Garcia. Patricia is a highly respected humanitarian and human rights advocate with experience in project design and delivery, campaigning and fundraising. Patricia has worked for more than 20 years in some of the world's most dangerous conflict include areas including Afghanistan, Bosnia, Kosovo, Rwanda, Sudan, South Sudan, South Sudan and the Thai Burma border. She has been appointed an officer of the Order of Australia in 2016 and was a finalist in the 2016 NSW Australian of the Year Awards for her contribution and services to the international humanitarian aid and development sector over the past two decades. Amazing, Patricia. Patricia was a humanitarian rights research fellow at the University of Sydney Center for Peace and Conflict Studies from 2000 to 2002. She designed the human rights course for the Masters of Peace and Conflict Studies at CPACS. She is a 2017 Rotary Peace Fellow and is currently working with the Institute for Economic and Peace as the Partnership Development Manager Patricia is also a honorary associate of the University of Sydney, where she is a seasoned successional lecturer on peace and human rights with a passion to promote and advance the 2013 Sustainable Development Goals agenda. Welcome Patricia and Charlie. Patricia, I would like you to begin with the woman as catalyst for peace. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'd like to say hello to everyone today and to take the opportunity to say thank you for um, joining us for this occasion on the 65th session of the Commission of Status of Women NGO Forum. I'd like to first acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Kamarigal people of the Eora Nation, and to recognize their connection to country, land and water, 
and community. And I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and to welcome Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are here present with us today. In a world where gender continues to be a dominant determinant of peace, it is important for people who are in charge to share the perspectives of those they serve. Coming together for the 65th session of the Commission of Status of Women Forum, we should recognize the incredible female leadership around the world as women participate in multiple spaces, tracks, and processes to achieve peace. Women should have a greater role in peace building. Elise Boulding, a Norwegian born American sociologist and author, peacemaker and matriarch of peace and conflict studies said in her article, Building a Culture of Peace, back in the 1960s, we were beginning to uncover data that showed the amount of the basic work of the planet that was being done by women. 80% of farming was being done by women. Anything that had to do with protecting the environment, the forests, the water, you name it. Much of our research showed that it was women who did it and that it was women who managed that kind of diplomacy that would keep groups from fighting each other too much. But what we have never done is overcome the gendered power structure. Today, more than 50 years later, we are yet to change the structure by which the formal economy only functions because it is subsidized by women's unpaid work. The SDG's 2030 agenda, with its vision of putting people and planet first, focusing on sustaining peace, putting gender equality as its center, and the leave no one behind principle, holds great promise for achieving an equal and sustainable future in a COVID-19 world. The Institute for Economics and Peace pioneered the empirical study of peace with its groundbreaking Global Peace Index and the Positive Peace Framework. IEP's GPI and Positive Peace measures are aligned with all the 12 targets of the Sustainable Development Goals 16, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions. IEP's in should be leading the way. And which woman should be, ahead, should be at the head of the table, leading the leaders. We're always talking about women needing to be having a seat at the table, but I'm now saying we should ask ourselves which woman should be at the head of the table and which woman should be leading the leaders. As a member of the IP partnerships team, we aim to bridge research to practice with partners and collaborating with governments communities, business, NGOs, and educational institutions to deliver positive peace workshops, online trainings, practical projects that contribute to sustainable peace. I'd like now to address that we will be having to listen to three outstanding women who are IEP ambassadors, working with groups, organizations, and communities, leading the way as catalysts for peace. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, I'm also sitting in Camaragal country and acknowledge the Camaragal people of the Aurora Nation. Pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Uh, I, I feel humbled to be sitting here on, on this panel today uh, when I, I look around the faces uh, uh, before me. Uh, Oren Santiago, who was uh, uh, my teacher <laughs> uh, back at Tula Longcorn, University and a uh, very well respected uh, uh, peace builder, uh, you know, Patricia Garcia, uh, who is a, a colleague and uh, once again a, a well respected peace builder and humanitarian aid worker. Uh, 
Laura Lee, I've only known for the last uh, couple of years, but know that she has an uh, uh, you know, immense amount of, of energy and a very connected and practical uh, peace builder. And of course, uh, my, my colleague, uh, Olivia, uh, who is part of uh, the research team here at IEP. And really, the research of IEP at IEP is the core of what IEP is all, all about. Uh, so it's Olivia uh, and uh, her colleagues that, that that really are the glue for for IEP, uh, and uh, Matthew and, and Amit uh, Tawi have a now have a long association of working with Affinity. So and it's it's once again it's it's lovely to be uh, involved in in this event. My role is 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 uh, uh, just a small role to to introduce IEP for for people who are unfamiliar with the organisation. And and just really speak briefly to uh, the, the the work that we we do. Uh, I will share my screen. Uh, so the the Institute for Economics and Peace is an independent, not for profit organization uh, where we're not aligned with any uh, political organization or any religious organization we're, we're very uh, firm on maintaining our, our independence really what our role is we're, we're in the business of measuring peace uh, not only measuring peace but also understanding uh, the economic benefit of peace and the economic impact of of, of violence uh, you can see in this slide uh, a a number of our, our key research products. We're certainly most known for the Global Peace Index, which Patricia uh, referred to. We're also uh, well known for the Global Terrorism Index. Uh, today, we'll touch a little bit on the, the Positive Peace Report. And that Positive Peace Framework is, is uh, what informs some of the storytelling by uh, the, the, the participants that, that follow. Uh, we, are, we are a global organisation. We, we are headquartered here in Sydney, Australia, but have offices in New York, Brussels, The Hague, Mexico and Harare. We, uh, our research is not positioned as, as uh, an academic exercise. It's, it's really positioned as a practitioner-focused research and we really strive to make our research uh, readable, accessible, attainable and, and practical. Uh, so we work hard at uh, uh, getting our, our research out there so it is, is uh, freely available to, to, to practitioners. I should add that all of our research is freely available on our website, uh, Vision of Humanity. Uh, you can see here that the type of uh, reach and uptake of uh, uh, IEP's uh, research uh, over the last 12 months, some 16 billion media impressions picked up in 150 countries, uh, referenced across a, a, a range, wide range of books and academic uh, uh, journal articles, uh, and our social media reach is uh, just under a, a billion. Uh, our research is picked up by uh, a wide range of people from uh, grassroots peace builders through to multi multilateral organisations such as OECD, Commonwealth Bank, uh, so Commonwealth Secretariat, World Bank and United Nations. So if you're going to measure peace, you really need to start with a definition and we, we rely on two definitions. Uh, first of all, that negative definition being the absence of violence or the absence of fear of violence. And it's this definition that we use to build the Global Peace Index. Uh, and what I think is the more exciting work is the uh, that positive uh, definition being the attitudes, institutions and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. And we use that positive, uh, positive peace definition to build our, our positive peace report. Uh, we certainly don't own that, that uh, definition of positive peace, that positive peace is, is uh, a, a, a definition that's well familiar with peace builders uh, globally, globally, having been coined by uh, a, a peace researcher some uh, nearly half a century ago, being Johan Gultung. So uh, just touching really quickly on, on the Global Peace Index, which is our most known piece of research, and it measures peace using that negative definition of peace, the absence of violence, of, the absence of fear of violence. So really what this report does is 
cancer, uh, the broken bits, if you like. Uh, what uh, it's uh, in its well, it's in its, its this will be the 15th year this year for the, the global peace index. And the, the beauty of that is it gives us over a decade and a half of data to, to rely upon. So we look and look at the trends globally, look at the trends within countries and with, within domains. Uh, we we, it ranks 163 countries. So we don't say a country is peaceful or not peaceful. We rank countries from the most peaceful country to the least peaceful country. Uh, and the 163 countries that we, we, we measure, it covers off on 99.7% of the global population. So uh, Olivia uh, and her colleagues, that what uh, the, their, their, their strength is, is being able to identify data sets and ag ag aggregate those data sets and tell the stories that sits within the data. So you can see that the Global Peace Index uh, aggregates 23 indicators. So when you look at the globe uh, coloured uh, from most peaceful to least peaceful countries, this is, this is what it looks like with the deep red countries being the least peaceful and the deep dark green countries being the, the most peaceful countries. So if you look at it from uh, the, in 2020, the, the globe decreased in peacefulness by 0.34%, uh, and this is the ninth deterioration in the, in the, the last, last 12 years. And certainly we can pr pr predict what we know from the early impact of, of COVID on, on peace indicators, there's a high likelihood that peace will continue to deteriorate uh, uh, over the, the, the next 12 months. Uh, when you look at uh, global trends over uh, over 12 months, this is what the trend line looks like. So I don't get excited about that trend line going up uh, because uh, IEP, <laughs> the higher the number, the less peaceful. So that trend line going up over the last uh, 12 years is an indicator of the world becoming less peaceful. You can see in that bar chart down the bottom, uh, the we've only had three years in that last 12 years where the, the globe has become uh, more peaceful. Uh, so over the last decade, uh, we have decreased, declined in peacefulness by by 2.5%. Uh, you can see that 81 countries become less peaceful and 79 countries become more peaceful. That sort of feels somewhat balanced, but what that's indicating is the countries that became less peaceful did so by uh, a greater extent. So it's an indicator of that growing inequality in, in peacefulness. Bit like that uh, adage, uh, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. We see the same in peace. Uh, the more peaceful countries become more peaceful, uh, less uh, uh, likewise. So, as I said, that we, we feel the interesting work and the, the, the transformational work is, is the work around positive peace, which once again, just reminding that uses that, that positive definition being the attitudes, institutions and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. We use that definition to use our positive peace report. Uh, and once again, the positive peace report ranks uh, countries from the, the most peaceful to the least peaceful based on that, that, that positive definition. And here's what the globe looks like uh, with the lighter blue countries being the less peaceful from a positive peace perspective and the darker blue countries being the more peaceful from a positive peace perspective. Another way to think about positive peace is, is positive peace is uh, you know, it's, it's looking at the good bits in a country as opposed to the broken bits in a country. And it really is uh, an indicator of a country's capacity to, to, to be peaceful. So with the Global Peace Index, we aggregate 24 indicators uh, and uh, we... Uh, 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 and they are positioned against these, these eight pillars of, of, of positive peace. And we know that uh, uh, the, the, the and when you look at these eight pillars of positive peace, you, there's probably no real surprises there. You can look at those eight pillars and think, yeah, well, that's, I, I sort of know that. But what we can demonstrate is uh, empirically is that these are the conditions you need within a community, within a society, within a country uh, to to create and sustain peacefulness. We also know that uh, positive peace is associated with uh, high levels, levels of uh, per capita income. Uh, higher positive peace countries are more resilient. Uh, higher positive peace countries have better environmental outcomes. Uh, they perform better against a, a range of wellbeing indicators. 
and they perform better against uh, development goals. They perform better against the millennial development goals, and we can see that they're, improve, they're performing better against the sustainable development goals. Uh, so I, I just wanted to bring in uh, this chart because I think it's really relevant to this discussion. When you when you sort of break up uh, positive peace, uh, you can see that uh, you know, overall in positive peace, peace, looking at the globe from a positive peace perspective, uh, the globe has improved. Uh, and, and that's been driven by uh, the, the, the domains of attitude, sorry, uh, structures and institutions. But the, the domain that has decreased over the last decade is this attitudes domain. We sort of know that intuitively as an ad from being global watchers, uh, but what this does is demonstrates that empirically. Uh, so the, that positive peace framework is, is what's uh, uh, used by us and by peace builders uh, as an approach by us and by approach by peace builders globally to approach peace building from a, a different perspective. Uh, and a, a difference is it's not focusing on the broken bits. It's, it's a strength-based uh, approach. Uh, it's looking at uh, the whole social system and trying to identify where do the opportunities lie uh, to build on strengths. So I'm going to finish there, and, but just remind you that all of our, our research uh, is available uh, on our website, Vision of Humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia and Charlie, for your insightful conversation. As you both were speaking, I, I was thinking in terms of positive and negative peace. And what it reminds me of is when we think about the, the policy and the practice of peace versus the integration and reality of peace. And so I think it's so important that this data is available. And when you think about that in terms of the Beijing plus 25 report that's out, one of the levers that is out there is talking about technology in a way forward. They're talking about the, um, how we handle data. And I think that's gonna be so key to making this a reality. So thank you so much. Now I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the IEP's researchers, Olivia, Laura Lee, and Irene. Olivia Adams is a research fellow at the Institute for Economics and Peace. As a research fellow, she contributes to IEP's consulting portfolio and core research. Most notably, the Global Terrorism Index, the Global Peace Index, and the Mexico Peace Index. Her areas of expertise include international development peace, conflict, and terrorism, with a focus on the relationship between gender and terrorism. Olivia's research is also focused on addressing the gaps in gender data to better understand gender-based violence and measure progress towards equality. She's currently conducting research for the 2021 Mexico Peace Index, which includes trend analysis of subnational data on femicide, sexual assault, and violence within the family. Olivia has previously worked at the Lowy Institute and holds a honors degree in international relations from King's College, London. Laura Lee Higgins is IEP's ambassador and Rotary Positive Peace Activator. She's presently employed with the city of Calgary as an indigenous relations strategist. Her mandate is to develop the city's indigenous relations portfolio in light of the 2016 Truth and Reconciliation Report. This includes the development of Calvary, Calgary and Indigenous Relations Office. Lori is married with two children. <laughs> As the current Miss Canada Globe, Lori is also an ambassador for Women in Need campaign, urging action to end violence against women. Lori obtained a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Alberta, majoring in political science and international relations. She has an MBA from Royal Road University, majoring in executive management and leadership, as well as an extensive community service and volunteerism. Laurie has participated in prestigious national leadership programs, most recently with the Governor General's Canadian Leadership Conference. Irene Santiago is a former executive director NGO Forum of the UN Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing, PRC on Gender Equality. She's a woman of many facets, peace builder, 
and a passionate advocate for women's rights in Asia and the Pacific. A native of the Philippines, she was instrumental in the implementation of a peace agreement that ended a decade long conflict with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front in Mandano, Southern Philippines. In collaboration with the Institute of Economics and Peace in 2019, Irene facilitated positive peace workshops in the district of, and bear with me with this, uh, Pacabelto in Davao City. Please uh, correct me when you come on. <laughs> the regional capital of Mindano, which led to the successful application of pillars modeled in the innovative project called Peace 911. In 1995, Irene led the NGO Farm on Women as part of the UN World Conference on Women in Beijing, the largest and most important global gathering for women empowerment to date. Welcome once again. We'll begin with Olivia as she presents addressing the gaps in gender data. If you have any questions, please hold them in the put them in a the chat box and we will address them at the end of their presentation. Thank you during the Q&A session. Thanks very much, Sasha. Um, and can I just also say it's great to be here with everybody today uh, alongside my colleagues, but also the other esteemed panelists um, and just hearing some of the work that they've done as well is um, admirable. So I'm hoping to contribute to this discussion today. I'm going to be taking a look at what are some of the gaps in the current gender data um, and how can we work together to address some of these to get a better understanding of female experiences across the world. Um, as a research fellow at the Institute for Economics and Peace, I work predominantly on our negative peace research. And so as Charlie mentioned earlier, we define negative peace as the absence of violence or the absence of the fear of violence. And so a lot of my research is around trying to analyze the different dynamics of conflict and types of violence. Um, and this has led me to examine how gender experiences are reflected in the existing stock of violence data. And it became apparent to me that in the current data we have, there are significant gaps which actually hinder our understanding of gendered experiences. And now this is significant because these gaps ignore the lived experience of many women and girls across the world. And without accurate data, implementing policy or measuring progress towards gender equality um, becomes increasingly difficult. So much of the global violence data that we see today is gender blind. And that is to say that it doesn't necessarily account for the differences in the experiences of men and women. So when we talk about the need for better gender data, we're talking about data which includes, um, but is not limited to a primary focus on sex disaggregation data. Um, and this is data which reflects all people's diverse experiences and identifies the drivers of different opportunities and outcomes for men and women. And so the gaps in gender data occur across many different areas. Um, this can include workforce participation or land ownership, but these gaps are particularly evidence for gender-based violence. And so gender-based violence remains one of the most persistent types of violence across the world, but it's arguably one of the most poorly understood. Conservative estimates suggest that at least one in three women have experienced some form of gender-based violence within their lifetimes. And gender-based violence is proven to present enormous economic and social costs. And these costs hinder the development and stability of communities worldwide. The broader costs of gender-based violence, such as productivity losses and trauma, are both destructive in the short term, but they also work to repeatedly damage longer-term peace and reconstruction across the world. Now, if we look to the Sustainable Development Goals, we find that only 12 of the 51 gender-related indicators can be reliably monitored at the global level. And these, ga these data gaps aren't just present in developing countries, but they're also present in a lot of developed countries as well. And so it's this missing data that can prove to be a serious impediment to progress. Without evidence, we cannot measure progress and we can't devise evidence-based policies or programs that aim to protect and empower women. And compre so comprehensive data um, is crucial really for incre increasing social awareness, um, increasing the unacceptability of violence, and also for demanding accountability of governments to address gender-based violence. So how do we currently measure gender-based violence and what are the issues with the current data? 
While currently it is not possible to directly observe the scale of gender-based violence at the global level or analyze trends over time because of the gaps in quality and quantity of the existing data that we have. Current data sources include nationally representative surveys, uh, data from police records, health system records, and data from the criminal justice system. However, of the existing sources, very few are directly comparable, meaning that they can't be compiled into one single data set without making statistical adjustments or imputing data. Um, and crucially, there is also a lack of trend data. And this means that we cannot know accurately if gender-based violence is getting better or worse at the global or regional level. So when we're looking at the current availability of gender-based data, it's important to be aware of the three main challenges. So the first one is uneven coverage. Now, poor coverage is a major issue in gender data. Um, many developing countries like behind, as I mentioned, uh, for instance, the Pacific, the lack of quality data, particularly for some of the region's most remote locations, remains an obstacle to understanding the gender dynamics of poverty, violence, and socioeconomic conditions in the region. Secondly, underreporting is a major issue when we're talking about gender data. The issue of underreporting is pervasive across all types of violence, but it's particularly an issue in regards to family violence and gender based violence where there may be large discrepancies in the number of crimes committed versus the number of crimes that are actually reported and investigated. And victims of these types of violence face a number of challenges in reporting their victimization. And this could be because victims are not believed, um, they may be treated as if the violence is their fault, or they may face stigma. And this is especially true in places where gendered violence is considered normal or perhaps justifiable. And thirdly, quality and comparability over time is a major issue as well. When it comes to gender-based violence, comparing countries that have vastly different legal frameworks and definitions of crime is difficult. For instance, intimate partner violence may not be criminalized in some parts of the world and therefore would not be included in official crime statistics. There's also a lack of historical data um, where gender-based violence data is not collected frequently enough and many countries lack a complete time series, so which hinders our ability to actually track any progress. And so to better explain some of these issues, um, I wanted to provide an example of some of the research I've done on gender-based violence in Mexico and some of the challenges faced in trying to understand what the current data tells us about the experience of women in Mexico. Now, in recent years, Mexico has seen a sharp increase in the rates of family violence, sexual assault, and femicide. And femicide is defined in Mexican law specifically as the murder of a woman for gender-based reasons. And based on the latest government data, the number of femicides has more than doubled in the last five years to just under a thousand cases in 2020. However, this figure could be higher given that states can provide unreliable data and sometimes do not investigate or classify femicides as such. So what does this, the current data on uh, homicides for men and women show us in Mexico? Well, it shows us that men are far more likely to be victims of homicide in Mexico, accounting for some 90% of deaths. However, male homicides are associated with organized crime trends while female homicides are more likely to be associated with intimate partner violence. So what we can infer from that data is that trends in violence against men have occurred in line with an escalation of organized crime activity and gun violence. However, violence against women has specific dynamics and modalities that need to be better understood. And this is important from a policy, policy perspective because approaches that aim to reduce overall violence by tackling organized crime activity and gun violence will not necessarily result in a reduction of violence against women. So we can look at femicide data from police and health records, um, but if we wanna look at the, the prevalence of sexual assault and family violence, these same data sources, their value may be limited because crimes such as sexual assault and family violence are significantly underreported in Mexico. And we find that overall, as many as nine in 10 crimes are not reported or investigated in Mexico. And so among some of the reasons I mentioned earlier, underreporting is also linked with perceived corruption, uh, distrust in authorities and high impunity rates with very few perpetrators being punished for these crimes. 
So with high underreporting rates, the value of police statistics for measuring gender-based violence can also be very limited. But there are ways to address this discrepancy. And the way we can do that is adjusting official statistics with rates of underreporting to produce an estimate that is more reflective of the actual situation of gender-based violence in a given state or country for a given year. And NGOs and civil society organizations have also played a very crucial role in implementing programs to address high rates of underreporting and to make sure that the data we receive from police records and health records is as reflective as it can be. Now, these approaches have aimed to facilitate access to reporting for women and to train law enforcement officials to better identify and process reported cases of gender-based violence. And within Mexico as well, the last few years has also witnessed growing activism around gender-based violence. And there is some hope that this growing awareness may encourage more women to report crimes and demand accountability from the government. But what I really wanted to highlight in using this example is the magnitude of the problem that can lie behind the data we have. In Mexico, what we really need to see is a concerted effort which tackles the discrepancy between the real and the reported experience of women in Mexico to make sure that the experience of every woman is counted. And this, there, are, as I mentioned, there are ways that we can address this. Um, this can be through facilitating women's access to reporting. This can be through investing in institutions which support victims of gender-based violence or improving the capacity of law enforcement and the justice system to investigate and prosecute cases of gender-based violence. And so that brings me to the end of my kind of brief presentation. Um, and I hope to have provided an overview of some of the key challenges we're dealing with when analyzing the existing data and point to some of the methods which we may be able to use going forward. Thank you so much for that. We will just go into our next presentation. Merci, thank you, Olivia. And thank you to everybody on the panel. Um, so Tanche, Danikara, Oki, Amba was Stitch, Bonjour, Bonjour, hello. So I'm Lorelai Higgins. I get called by many names. You've heard a few already on this call. Um, I'm climbing from Treaty 7 territory and home of the Métis Nation, Region 3 in Calgary, Alberta, way up in Canada. So it's such a pleasure to connect with everyone globally. And what an incredible panel. Um, and what incredible institutions to invite us here and have these conversations, critical conversations that are timely. COVID has impacted us in ways we never imagined, especially women. And knowing that institutions like these are investing in these conversations and having women come together and have conversation with males as well is so critical. And so I'm so grateful. So I have a little bit of a presentation for you. I'm just gonna share my screen. And so we've heard quite a bit about some data. So I thought one of the things is one of the Institute for Economics and Peace ambassadors and a practitioner in the field, I could show you how some of the data is being applied in, in some of the work that I've been doing. Um, Charlie said to us that part of this is practic practitioner focused research. And so I wanna show you some of the ways that I've been able to actually practically apply this and use some of those confusing data points as like real things in action in community. So part of the story, um, is that I didn't know what peace building was. I didn't know how to measure peace. I didn't know what negative peace was. I didn't know what positive peace was. But in 1998, I decided that I needed to see the world and I went to South Africa as a Rotary Exchange student. Well, that changed my whole life because that led to the career that I have today. So while I was there, I started learning cross-culturally. I was with a bunch of other exchange students. I was working in South Africa and through the diversity and richness of being together, I started thinking about, wow, these are some answers. This is how we connect as people. We're learning each other's languages. We're gathering in community, we're sharing food, but I didn't have words for it yet. I just knew that something unique and distinct was happening 
with how is connecting with people and understanding what it takes to actually create peace. So after that year, as mentioned in my very long bio, I did take um, political science and, and international relations, and that led to a career in peace building. And I still didn't fully know what that was. I was out um, on my internship with the Canadian government in Bolivia, and I was working on cross-cultural understanding, Indigenous human rights, and we were connecting in ways and community that I couldn't, I couldn't quite still pull together. But I knew that by asking the community what they needed and looking at what they had instead of what they didn't have, uh, magic was happening in our projects. And at this point, I was, I was working globally and we had projects everywhere, all the way from Finland and Poland, Austria, Germany, Guyana, uh, Dominica, and, and the list goes on. And so that made me curious. And so along the way, as mentioned, that I was a Rotary Peace Fellow. So this is my class from 2019. And this is what started giving me the framework more uh, for peace building and what positive peace was. So we were in Thailand and you will hear from mom um, in the Iron Santiago shortly, but she was one of my professors and I had the chance to actually peace build with her a little bit in the field. Well, see her in action. I don't know what I actually did, but I got to see her in action and what peace building, building actually requires. So there is a picture as proof with me and mom Inde. We're there in the field and um, there's me on the left there in my Métis sash. And what's important for this slide in the story is something that mom Inde always says. She says the peace building, and I don't want to steal your line, Irene, but it stuck with me for a long time, that practically peace building is actually about increasing connectors and decreasing dividers. And that has stuck with me with the most easy way to explain it to in community and to how to work with it. And for me, it's particularly relevant. And so some of you may recognize the sash I'm wearing, some not. But in that picture, that is my Métis sash. My family's Indigenous from Canada, and it has been a long history to be able to wear that sash in public. Um, at certain points, it was outlawed to wear that. It was also a point of shame. It was also not anything that designated any type of status. And as times have changed and we have fought for Indigenous human rights, um, I can now wear my sash in public and it also designates me as a member of the Métis Nation, which is really important. Um, and where does that lay with increasing connectors and decreasing dividers? Well, culturally, we all come from somewhere. And so we have many things that we can actually share. And one of the beautiful things in sharing culturally and as we travel around the world is food, dance, clothing, and they become sources of connection points. So that is, leads me into my next role that has um, made my peace building even stronger. So this is now the Rotary Positive Peace Activators Program. And in this photo somewhere in there, you'll see Charlie hiding out. So you heard Charlie speak earlier, but we had the chance to meet through this program shortly after I was done in Thailand. And um, what an incredible program. It is a partnership between the Institute for Economics and Peace and Rotary. And really it is putting peace into action. So actually activating um, peace building. So Charlie already did a great job of showing us these slides and the data and Olivia has done a great job of explaining it to us. Um, and so what I want to do is show you in a community context what I've been doing with this because it's been super exciting. Um, so I am an ambassador for the Institute for Economics and Peace and I mentioned a Rotary Positive Peace Activator. But what does this mean? What does it look like in community? So some of the things I've been able to do, and it's important you understand the, the story of how I got here, is with all this language I've developed and skill sets and practical research, I've been able to see points in my community um, and internationally where projects can benefit from lenses of looking at what we have, looking at a systems perspective, and also looking at a uh, positive, positive piece. So over the last three years, I've been working in a team to actually develop our Indigenous Relations Office, and that is built on the foundation of positive peace. And so that idea of how do we have good relations with neighbours? How do we actually have a well-functioning government? What does it look like to have the acceptance of the rights of others? So you can see those weaving of those pillars into this. And this is an engagement like no other the City of Calgary has ever done. But we actually uh, talked to our elders first, and we actually got... Um, from them, what, what should we do for an Indigenous Relations Office? What should it look like? And we went to the community. And if you look in the middle, that green bubble made some people uncomfortable because we did ceremony valid validation before we took anything to council. That was unheard of in our area of the world. And so we validated everything we heard from the elders in the community. 
and then we took it to council. So we've been uh, changing the way that we do engagement with Indigenous peoples and also um, using those lenses of positive peace. So how else have I practically been using this? Um, so during the first part of the pandemic here in Calgary, I was called into service for our um, pandemic response unit. And I had the chance to actually lead our communities around our actual community connections. So I was able to look at how a country can quickly react in a time like the pandemic and actually what pillars were supporting which ones, which ones were we not strong in, and I remember having conversations with the Institute for Economics and Peace when all this was going on, because I said, you know, what I've seen from all of this is community coming forward. I've seen good relations with neighbors. I've seen acceptance of the rights of others. And in Calgary, we had a very strong activation system, especially initially where, you know, we had 10,000 pounds of restaurant food that was going to waste. But then we had a bus company with 900 drivers who was looking to, well, what can we be doing? Could we be delivering that food? So we started looking through the lens of those pillars of positive peace and saying, well, how are we doing here? What do we need more of? What do we need less of? Where can we strengthen? And so as the lead for that area during um, the first six months of the pandemic, I had a chance to analyze that. And so that led to this overlay and the last portion of it we're just finishing. And Charlie, you have not seen this yet, um, but it's a big surprise for you. So we, what we did is we looked at what were all the assets that we had. This is an actual asset map that we've created and we're gonna be overlaying it with the pillars of positive peace. And so where do they interact with the assets in the community? This one side is actually the guide But these are all the strengths that we found in our community part. And not that it's not tough now, but we were able to react as a community. And so you can see everything range from specific people and restaurants to different institutions, to different associations and organizations. But all of that came together to create a cohesive response that required all of us in our community. Um, and so the next phrase of this will be, we're gonna be overlaying it with the pillars themselves. So another practical example um, that I want to give you of how you can apply this in your work in your communities is I have a new role. So my bio is actually, it's not totally correct. <laughs> I have a new role that's very, very new, not new enough to have been on my bio yet, but I just took on the role as community lead for our anti-racism work in Calgary. And so as I enter into this work, I'm already thinking about the pillars of positive peace and obviously my indigenous relations uh, work and my heritage comes with me. Um, and as I still look through the lens of truth and reconciliation, but in an anti-racism context, what does that mean? And so I'm starting the journey of working through um, tools and data that the Institute has to be able to apply to this specific area of focus for the city and looking at really how are we gonna change the system. So another context that, and I know I'm going quickly through all these, but I want to show you all the ways that I've been able to apply this since 2019. Um, Charlie has seen this, so it's not as big a surprise, but we've been working with, um, in partnership with Rotary International, or sorry, Rotary District 5040 in British Columbia, the mediators beyond borders, and obviously using the frameworks of the Institute for Economics and Peace, but looking at that in an indigenous context. So we're working with the Niska Nation. And so the word for peace is GACS. And it's so lovely to be translating this into the ways of knowing from the perspectives of the indigenous nation. We are learning so much. And I always tell them every day that we have a session that I'm learning much, much more than I am teaching. Um, so when we look at the pillars of positive peace, one of the things that they talked to us a lot about was actually, well, where do the sacred teachings fit? Where do we fit this in with how we conduct ourselves? And so that's a new lens for me to look through the work. But these, these in particular are just seven of the sacred teachings. Many communities have more than that. Um, but then we looked into like agreements. How do we treat each other? So that's the external circle and the secret teachings are in the middle. And because this is a partnership, we wanted to overlay, well, where does Rotary fit? How does it line up? And so this is the Rotary four-way test. And so as we look at negative peace and positive peace, um, this is how it starts to line up. And so you can see how we're overlaying it and it works as an interconnected web. And so as we look at identity, culture, 
ways of knowing, ways of being, ways of doing. We're interlaying that with the pillars of positive peace and um, culturally translating that. So what does that mean? What does a well-functioning government mean in for the NISCO people? And how does that work if you look at the seven sacred teachings or some of the other guiding um, ways of knowing from the community? So we started to overlay it a little bit um, in the middle there. I won't have time to fully explain, but those are sort of basic needs and how they fit in and that idea in the Niska Nation of the common goal. And so that you don't actually um, worry about yourself. You worry about the common goal and how people come together. And so um, this all is obviously a learning journey, but really rich in knowledge and an incredible way to be using all of the work of the Institute of the Economics and Peace and all the amazing people that are there to support. So the last piece I want to leave you with is just that idea of like actually in the community. So for me, peace building is everyone every day. Um, that is a phrase that I, I appreciate because it can be nebulous. And as a young girl, I never saw women peace building. Um, and I never saw anyone who certainly looked like me. And I didn't even know what peace building was. So I really realized, you know, it's it's everyone every day. So some practical ways I've been able to use it is a new program that's just developing in my Rotary District here in, near Calgary is Adventures in Positive Peace Building. So getting youth to actually talk about positive peace building. And we've been working through the contacts of the New York office for the Institute for Economics and Peace for this program. But really looking at a local level is how can we get our youth more involved in peace building? Um, the other one, and this is the last thing I'm going to share with you in terms of how I've been using it is um, it was mentioned at the beginning, some of you may or not may or may not have caught it, but I am the current Mrs. Canada Globe and it is a bit of a stretch out of my normal realm of existence. But in talking to some of my friends over at the Institute of Economics and Peace, when I was approached to be in the pageant, I, I had thought about it and, and somebody had said, well, Lorelai, what if, what if you went there and you actually talked about world peace and you talked about the pillars of positive peace? What would what would that look like? And I started getting really exciting. So there's a new article out from my EP, a new blog uh, part, and it actually says at the bottom there, competing in and winning beauty pageants gives this IEP ambassador a platform to talk about women leaders and peace builders. So it's true, this is the crowning moment in November. And so you will find me all over online right now, um, linking that strong need for female voices in peace building um, with the pageant platform. And the pageant itself supports the Women in Need Foundation. And uh, they support women who have gone through domestic violence uh, situations. So what we know in Canada is that domestic violence rates over the last year have risen 30%. And that's what we know. And so I'm, I'm very passionate about um, finding ways, whatever platforms exist, to actually help women and to actually um, elevate women's voices and amplify them where we can. So uh, one of the things that I just want to leave you with here is that when I asked my elders about competing in the pageant, they came back and said, Lorelai, um, we think it's good. Um, talking about peace building and women's voices is really important and elevating um, the work where you can. They said, but you need to call it, carry your culture with you. And so I've pushed pageant limitations in some regards by requesting to wear my sash on covers um, and things like that. And so what you will see in the article that is out from the Institute for Economics and Peace is really um, how I get to celebrate peace building as a woman. But what I say in the articles, I get to celebrate and share what it means to show up as a woman who is many things, including a mother, a partner, a leader, and a peace builder. So my newest blog, which is what how I lead to where I'm at now, is Everyday Peace Building with Mrs. Canada Globe 2020, 2021. And so those are the kinds of things that as I look to peace build practically, um, those are all just examples of the way the Institute for Economics and Peace has been really beneficial. And so um, hopefully it's been of use to see that you really can apply this material all the way from beauty pageants to um, city projects to cultural projects with local communities. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Lorelei. This has been so powerful. I also want to thank Olivia for enlightening us on the gender gaps and for you being a positive ambassador for activating positive peace. We're gonna move into our last speaker. Finally, Irene will be sharing with us activating positive peace case study, Peace 911, 
a final reminder to please put all of your questions into the chat and we will address it in the Q&A session. Okay, am I all right? Can you hear yes. me now? Okay. Absolutely. Well, a little more than 25 years ago, on August 30, 1995, to be exact, I was in Beijing in a very large football field, looking out to 6,000 participants at the grand opening of the NGO Forum on Women. Matthew, we can have the picture now. As executive director of the NGO forum that ran parallel to the UN Fourth World Conference on Women, I had the task of being the program host of this dazzling event. Soon, the symphony orchestra played Ode to Joy and balloons were released to the roar of the 30,000 women and a few men who came for the 10 day gathering. The crowd then sang, gotta keep on moving forward, never turning back, never turning back. Little did we know that 25 years after, we couldn't even have a proper celebration of what has been hailed as the most important set of conferences and gatherings on women's empowerment in history. In 2020, COVID-19 ravaged the earth. There could not be an ode to joy, no moving forward. It was hard even to stay in place. As I look back at that event in 1995, I remember what the NGO Forum slogan was, and it seems to be telling us what we need to do again in 2021. Our slogan said, look at the world through women's eyes. And what do women's eyes see? Apart from the people in anguish and despair born of uncertainty over our seeming incapacity to thwart the virus, lives lost, jobs gone, school time lost, cracks in relationships, increase in domestic violence, collapsed markets, stigma, hate speech, diversion of precious government resources, resources to fighting the virus, and on and on. But beyond these, women also see something else, something people often say about women, our resilience, our strength, our resourcefulness, and our capacity for multitasking and to take matters into our own hands. I am amazed at how the situation wrought by COVID-19 is so similar to that in areas racked by violent conflict. All these conditions are nothing new to those who have experienced war and its aftermath. Vast populations have been through the anguish, the fear and the deprivation resulting from the ever-present violence in their lives. Most of them feel powerless to change anything. I work in a district in Davao City in the Philippines where I live. It covers 14 villages, all within the entire ancestral domain of the indigenous Ata tribe. The district called Pakibato had known nothing but continuous violent conflict since the 70s. It was known as the killing fields of the Philippines, as the Philippine military battled the communist New People's Army in a protracted, protracted war. The 41-year-old mayor of Davao City, 
who had heard stories of atrocities committed in Pakibato ever since she was a child, decried the loss of lives and opportunities. She wanted an end to the violence under her watch. She believed that the response to the 50 year armed rebellion was not more military actions. The city would engage in peace building instead. I was asked to help design the peace building initiative. We started with sharing sessions. Basically, we listened to the people in Pakibato, farmers, indigenous people, women, youth, and members of faith-based groups. Over and over, they told us that their most immediate concerns and problems were two, fear and hunger. The city government immediately got to work. The initiative was called Peace 911 to signify that the situation in Pakibato was an emergency. I remember saying, the patient is hemorrhaging and has high fever. Before anything else, we have to stop the hemorrhaging and bring the fever down. To address the fear expressed by every man, woman, and child, we talked to the police and the military. So we would all be on the same page. The security forces were not to enter people's houses without a valid and legal reason. The city government was going to deal with human rights violations immediately and severely. In short, the security sector now convinced that the military solution that had been used for decades did not at all diminish the violent conflict. They became an integral part of Peace 911. Since the atrocities committed by the military during the Marcos martial law years still lingered in people's memories, it was critical to build trust first. Soldiers began to participate in community activities such as cleaning school premises, feeding school children, and conducting seminars for the youth. Peace 911 also dealt with the people's fear of both the military and the MPA by opening a hotline that anybody could call. A dedicated staff in City Hall ensured that any concern got an immediate response. One month, and then another passed. No skirmishes were reported. Without our intending it, the hotline became a means for the rebels to communicate to us when they wanted to surrender. Eventually, almost 200 men and women turned themselves in. They surrendered their firearms and led the military to where landmines had been planted. To address the problem of hunger. Women were trained in container gardening that enabled them to readily have organic vegetables available for their families and for their neighbors. In this type of gardening, containers are made of discarded tetra packs, plastic bottles, or coconut husks. The women were taught to make organic fertilizer from materials av available around their houses. This activity was a resounding success with the, with the women because it meant they did not have to walk too far to plant weed and harvest. While tending to their container garden in the morning, they could look after their children as they prepared for school. The activity was effective because it was compatible with women's gender roles. After the immediate problem of hunger was solved, Peace 911 started a livelihood project that answered the need for both food and income. Women grouped together to sell rice in their neighborhood, starting in the barangays or villages where women had to walk a great distance to buy the staple at prices higher than usual. In the aftermath of violent conflict, it is important that responses are big and fast, not small and slow. After only nine months, the military declared Pakibato clear of the violent conflict. Now, now that we have achieved, uh, have achieved negative peace, 
or the absence or fear of violence. The second phase is now aimed at building peace, positive peace, or ensuring that our patient regains and maintains good health and there is no relapse. It means addressing the inequality in political, economic, and social relationships that is at the root of violence. Can we have the next one? Okay. Each barangay or village is now poised to build the house of peace. They are building eight pillars of positive peace using a plan they themselves made after extensive discussions with different sectors and groups to show their significant participation in the building of peace. The women added gender equality as the floor of the entire house. Pantay pantay ang babae o lalaki means gender equality. Equal, equality between men and women. And that is now the floor of the house. Inspired by the initial success of the peace building approach, academic institutions, cooperatives, social enterprises, civic and professional clubs, and the public are pitching in with their resources and unique capacities. So um, we are now in the positive phase, a positive peace phase, and um, it, um, the IEP, the Institute for Economics and Peace, um, defines positive peace as providing the optimum environment for human potential to flourish. Peaceful structures, institutions, and attitudes ensure that peace is durable. Knowing that all our actions were components of a system, we mapped our actions as shown in these two slides. So we mapped them and showed that this was all a system. So this is uh, one slide and then the other slide, please, Matthew. In fact, okay, this is, so this is the other side where you show that there is a system. In Pakibato, I learned as I did 40 years before while organizing women in Islamic communities as, a, as well as while I was negotiating a peace agreement, that the most important change should be made in is in relationships that are at the root of human interaction. Society functions on the basis of these relationships. It is inequality in relationships, in the economy, in politics, in our social life, that is at the root of violent conflict. Therefore, is it any wonder that the gaps that have become even wider in the time of COVID are those where the powerful become more powerful and the powerless even more so? Where the few rich have gotten richer and the many poor have become even poorer? We give them names like oligarchy, plutocracy, authoritarianism, fascism, capitalism. But it really is quite simple. Structural analysis is analyzing if the relationship is equal or unequal. Who benefits? Who suffers? One of the programs we have initiated in Pakibato is called the Peace Economy. And the slogan is sharing wealth. Because as Winnie Bianima of UNAIDS has said, Leave no one behind, right? But don't forget, but also let no one go too far ahead. Yeah. We often look at the poor and work with them all the time. And we don't even look at uh, the 1% or 0.1% who are getting too far ahead. So this is another way of saying we need to change our concepts and our perspectives. So as we talk about women as catalysts for peace, let us examine the three powers we possess. The power of our concepts, 
the power of our capacities and the power of our politics, conceptual, technical, political. First, the power of our concepts. Gender equality is integrated in economic, political, and social equity, as Olivia has just said, as the base for building the eight pillars of positive peace. For the past 25 years since Beijing, we have pursued gender mainstreaming as the default strategy for, what was the language? Integrating gender into the structures and institutions of our society. It worked some, but it didn't work big time because we integrated gender into societies that were largely unjust and unequal. So that a few women rose to the top and that was gender mainstreaming. Data was sex disaggregated and that was gender mainstreaming. And women entered the low paying job market in greater numbers, and that was gender mainstreaming. So, now what to do? Beyond being at the table and having our perspectives on our issues on the table, we need to turn the tables. We need transformation. And now is the time, yes, in the time of COVID, the greatest upheaval of our times. When else? Second, the power of our capacities. William Urey said it well. He said, the secret to peace is simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. The secret to peace is us, the surrounding community. As Lorelai said, peace building is about increasing connectors and decreasing dividers so that equitable development can occur. Women's capacities for connecting and including are harnessed every day in their many interactions. Add to these the capacity to empathize and consider another as not another. These are the capacities essential to peace building. And lastly, the power of our politics. Redefining power. The COVID crisis has spectacularly shown how female leaders lead. In fact, handling the public health crisis worldwide has given us many lessons in public leadership and followership led by women. How many of us have marveled at the likes of Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand, Angela Merkel of Germany, and, and Chai Ing-wen of ta Taiwan? One of the most read articles during the pandemic was entitled, What Two Countries with the Best Coronavirus Responses Have in Common? Mm -hmm. Women Leaders. New Zealand's Jacinda Ardern's leadership has been called a master class in crisis leadership and has saved our people from the ravages of the pandemic. From the truthfulness and decisiveness of Chancellor Merkel and President Tsai, to the use of the latest technology by Prime Minister Jakob Zlotir of Iceland and Prime Minister Marine of Finland, to the regard for the feelings and well-being of children by Prime Minister Solberg of Norway and Prime Minister Fredriksen of Denmark, these leaders showed that dealing with a crisis requires all the strong qualities that women possess. In the sense, these women have redefined power to mean this. Power is the potency to act for what is good. The big question is the same question Leo Tolstoy asked many, many years ago. How then shall we live? The answer is, as we rebuild and we reconstruct, we shall not recreate inequality. What then must we do? The eight pillars of positive peace provide 
strategic framework framework for work for up for optimal flourish building structures institutions and the attitudes of equality within these eight pillars will ensure that the new world in the aftermath of this pandemic will enable women men and children to live long happy and peaceful lives mary b anderson who influenced us all to do no harm, wrote many years ago about the metaphor of a mainstream. As we were just beginning to do gender mainstreaming as the main strategy to integrate gender in development, Mary flipped the metaphor. And instead of the mainstream, why not a river? She wrote, but what happens to a river when another river of equal size and force merges with it? The water will rise and the river will run more deeply and rapidly. But most assuredly, it will change its course. The power of our concepts, the power of our capacities, and the power of our politics will change the course of human history. No more waiting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Before we move into the Q&A session, into I would like to take this opportunity to thank Affinity Intercultural Foundation, the Institute for Economic and Peace, and the Journalists and Writers Foundation. We started this evening with our esteemed guests. We want to thank you for coming and for sharing your perspective on gender equality. But we know that it boils down to one thing. Women's rights is human rights. And it is the spirit and the heart of woman that makes a difference. We're so excited that we have measures in place now to not only present new indices, but to begin to hold people accountable for inclusion. Inclusion is not just, as Irene said and Olivia said, and Laura Lay said, not just getting into the door at the table, but turning the tables, taking your culture everywhere, and so we're so excited that as we look at inclusion and we, we begin to look at justice and we begin to look at we begin to look at opportunities for women, we will not only just let them in the door, give them the seat at the table, but we will allow them to lead. We want to thank you for all of you who have come out. We ask that you would begin to put your questions into the chat so that we can take a look at them. And so we can begin to ask, ask them, and you can ask any of the panelists any question. There was so much great information here tonight. One of the things that we really are looking forward to in the coming months, in the coming years, is how technology and data will ensure security and justice and peace and, conclusion, and inclusion for all women. Thank you. We have one question. Do you think IEP would be interested in researching and evaluating the progress made in women empowerment and gender equality since 1995? Speaking of Beijing plus 25, maybe a global women's empowerment index. Now this was not di directed at anyone. So anyone on the panel, please feel free to address it and we can take turns answering that question. Thank you for that question. Um, I'll take a stab at addressing this first question we have. Um, I think this goes back to, you know, the, the issue I was pointing out in addressing the data gaps. Um, and so whilst 
it would be incredible if we were able to measure globally the progress in women's empowerment. We first of all need the high quality data to be able to do that. Um, and doing it at this point where there are still gaps within the data um, poses the risks that the data or the results perhaps skew in favor of countries that have better data systems in place um, and are better able to measure that progress. So what we do want to avoid is uh, creating an index, for instance, that isn't robust and it isn't reflecting the true um, situation and true experience of women and the progress towards female empowerment. Um, and that's, that's kind of the core of IEP's research as well, is making sure that the evidence we are provided is data-driven, it's robust, and it's very accurate. Um, but what I was saying in my presentation and trying to make the case for is there are ways in which we can improve and address these gaps, and we really should do that so that we are able to um, create indices such as these to really measure at the global level, at the regional and at the national level as well, and even perhaps the local level. Um, so there really is that strong case that we need to make sure every woman counts um, and we are gathering the data in the most accurate way um, and compiling the data to make sure we have an accurate represent representation of female experience. Can I, can I say something? Yes. Um, when I first um, uh, got to know about the positive peace index. Um, that was one of my questions really is where's, where's gender here? You know, because all the uh, free flow of information, sound business environment, all those, I couldn't find gender in any of those. And, and, and my, the answer that was given to me was, uh, we are driven by data. And I'm going like, Excuse me, women are not in the, uh, usually in statistics. So it's, it, 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 is, it is in fact an advocacy. You really have to go be aggressive, Olivia. So I'm glad you said it's underreported. It's under, you know, all of this that, that you um, recognize that these are there. Because if we rely, we just rely on, it's not there. So therefore, we're, it's not going to be, that's how we invisibilize uh, women. Um, there's one uh, index that I know of that's already come out and, and it come out, came out last year. It's the one that is um, for the US, US of America. Uh, and it's, I think, done for all the states. Um, and it's done by the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. So there, there are those, um, and those types of indices that, that we can begin to look at. And it's not just looking at violence against women, which is a big issue, but the other, as I just said, economic, political, they're all there. Gender is in everything. So, so it, it, it also means, um, I think, defining, uh, de defining a, a, a framework of what is the system that we want to look at. Excellent. Yeah, that's an excellent uh, indice. And they do focus on three, Georgetown focuses on three areas, the justice, security, and inclusion. Uh, an, an excellent indice. The next question, this year marks the 25th anniversary of the Fourth World Conference on Women Held in Beijing in 1995. As some of, as some of who witnessed the adoption of this declaration, how much progress have we achieved in women's social and economic empowerment, as well as gender equality globally? What are the three major challenges that hold us back? That's a whole study. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, maybe I'll just I'll just do the the last the last question because I want to be I just want to go back to my what you know to the speech I made. Um, uh, if, if you look at what we've done in the past 25 years, it's really, we really have to look at, uh, and this is the contribution of, uh, of IAP to my thinking, is to look at the structures, institutions, and attitudes. You have to look at all of those. And I have a very simple way of understanding, and I teach, so I have to make it simple. 
okay? So structures are relationships. And that's what I said, is it equal or unequal? Institutions are sets of rules. In other words, when you say, let us institutionalize, what are you saying? You're saying, let us set the rules so that there are sanctions for those who don't follow and there are um, rewards for those who do. And then the attitudes, what the attitudes are the justification for the things that you do in your structures and your, and your um, institutions. So, so I think we don't think that way yet. You know, we, we, we sort of still compartmentalize. Um, and, and I would like to see the day when we look at, you know, this whole thing as a system. And that's, and that's your, um, one of the major contributions of, of the indices of IEP, is that think of all of these things as a system. And when you want to change something, you look at structures, institutions, and attitudes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Let me repeat that question. It says, the next question is, in what ways or how do gaps in gender data hinder progress towards peace? Thank you. Thank you. Sasha, that question. Um, I'll, I'll take a, a go at the, uh, the data questions. Um, I think fundamentally the gaps in the gender data as we've kind of emphasized throughout these presentations is that if we're not counting, if we're not including women in these data, how are we able to make policy and programs that aim to protect and empower women? Um, and that seems like a bit of an impossible task if we don't know accurately and reliably, reliably what these issues are and how they impact men and women differently how then can we expect policies to be um, effective when we implement them based on the current data that we have? Um, I think another key issue as well is the, the lack of trend data to be able to say that from point A to B, what has the progress been or have there been improvements or deteriorations in terms of the protection of women, uh, violence against women or the empowerment of women, women's roles in the labor force, for instance. Um, and so I think that is, a, when we're talking, when we're advocating for better gender data, that's something we really need to pay attention to is really getting that timely uh, trend data so that we can make those comparisons across time um, and be able to look back to say 1995, for instance, um, and make a good, and look at a good account of how those trends have changed. Um, I think, the example I used with the, the Mexico example um, is a case in point as well in saying that if we're not looking at these gendered experiences and we're not going down to that granular level and disaggregating data by sex, then the policies that we do implement, for instance, to reduce violence, um, they may work to reduce male violence, but not female violence. Um, and in fact, these policies might be counterintuitive. They may work to reduce male violence, but they could increase female violence. Um, so I think there's, there's quite a few issues to unpack there, but I think really it is the robustness and the timeliness um, of the gender data that we really need, because otherwise we're, we're not implementing policy that's based on sound evidence. And just to piggyback off of that, another question with the with the data, which is important, we have to consider the technology. And we know there are several indices out there today. Um, how do people trust or how do people reconcile one indice from the other? Yeah, I think that that's another great question. Um, I think what we are seeing now is a, a data revolution. We're trying to um, really prioritize the role of data in decision making and policy making. Um, but what we do need to be careful with is how do we use all this data that we can collect digitally, for instance, 
Um, and I think the COVID era has been a really great example of that, of the, the need for the timeliness of data and, the, and how granular we need the data to be to make quick decisions um, and responses that, that are gonna help um, the most vulnerable in society. Um, what I will say on that is I think that's a, an area of research that we really need to focus on as well. Um, if, you know, for instance, if we're looking towards this data revolution and there's suggestions that we take um, internet surveys or mobile phone records and things like that to, to close these gender gaps. But what we also need to consider there is that not every single um, person has access to internet or a phone. Um, so by taking this data digitally, are we exacerbating those digital gaps that we see? For instance, the Pacific, um, the gap between men and women having access to a phone or internet is pretty stark. Um, so I think, you know, we really need to harness the power of technology and we, we really should be including it. Um, and this is the way forward for getting better gender data but there are some things that we need to be careful of and make sure that we address um, to make sure that we're not, again, missing the experience of a select group of women. Excellent. Thank you for that answer. One of our mem audience members asked, what opportunities do one have to assist and or participate with the Positive Peace Program? It's Charlie. Uh, yeah, I'll take that question. Before I do, I, I did notice that Laura Lee had her hand up and wanted to contribute to one of the, the earlier questions. Laura Lee, did you, did you yeah. want to oh, contribute sure. before yeah, I answer yeah. that? Sure. Thank you, Charlie, and thanks for the interjection. I was just going to say, you know, as we think about that, and Olivia said it really well at the end, we don't want to miss the experience of one woman or a group of women in this generalized data that might occur. And so one of the things that I know is specifically relevant to Canada is as we look at the experience of Indigenous women in particular, one thing uh, is to think about uh, how government policies and Irene said, you know, think about structures, institutions, attitudes, how does that impact? And so recently somebody had said to me, why aren't there more Indigenous women with PhDs? Like if we could just find one. And I was like, oh, do you know that at one point that you either had to give up your First Nation status or not go to school, you had to pick. And so it's really easy to make assumptions, but in the data, we can't always put that information. And as Olivia said, then when we cross correlated, we don't have that, we've missed that picture. And so with women in particular, we have, and it's happened with gender, but also with different cultural groups, but we have policies and existing ones still that have led to some of the existing state. And if we don't take into account that full systems picture, um, we're gonna miss really critical points of data. And so it is really important that we look at the whole view. And, and I don't know, um, just to comment on that, if there would be benefit to comparing uh, women's experiences around the globe, because you do have to have such a distinct look at all the things that have been in place that have led to today and that are currently still in place. So, so I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Charlie, for the space for that. Thank you so much, Charlie and Laura Lay. Thank you so much for that. The next question we have is how has COVID-19 affected women and girls within your sphere, sphere, sphere excuse me, <laughs> within your sphere of influence? And what has been done to address the potential changes? And with that question in mind, uh, I believe he might even be talking about informatics and the role of informatics in uh, dealing with the whole COVID-19 situation and how, how, how have that has impacted you on a local level as well as a, a global level? Uh, sorry, sorry, Shasta, I feel like I'm <laughs> ruining your flow. I just wanted to address that, that previous question. I gave the opportunity for um, uh, Laura Lee to interject there, but uh, there was a question around how can people participate uh, with, uh, in the Positive Peace Program. I would like to, to answer that question before I hand to Libby to answer. Uh, sure, to, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so, and, and there are a couple of uh, simple uh, no-cost uh, ways, which are a really way great way to to deepen knowledge around positive peace so the institute for economics and peace has an online positive peace academy uh, anyone can can log on and 
Take the Positive Peace Academy. I'll put a link in the, the, the chat box uh, very shortly. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it steps through uh, three, three modules. It only takes about two hours. Uh, it's, it's quite uh, engaging with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, videos and, and interactive. So <clears throat> it's a good way to deepen understanding around uh, uh, positive peace. For people who want to dive a bit deeper, uh, you would have picked up that uh, uh, some of the people on the panel, in fact, most of the people on the panel, including myself, uh, are IEP ambassadors. Uh, so uh, the uh, Institute for Economics and Peace Ambassadors Program uh, runs twice a year. We're actually at this very moment uh, uh, have the IEP ambassador program open and accepting applications for the first cohort for 2020. So the IEP ambassador program is, is really designed uh, at people who are interested in positive peace and looking about how they can activate around positive peace in their, uh, in their communities or within their work, whether they're policy level people or, or educators. Uh, and it's an opportunity to, to, to dive uh, deeper into the research, not only research, but hear from uh, other practitioners, such as some of the practitioners you've heard today and how they've applied positive peace in their communities. Um, but really, uh, I think uh, the uh, a takeout, I think, is that you know, if you're looking to activate positive peace, and really that one of the shifts that we look to create with people who engage with uh, the positive peace approach is that you do what you can uh, within your capacity and sphere of influence. Um, so, uh, you know, peace is, is often thought as of something that is done to us uh, by others, uh, particularly governments. <laughs> uh, whereas, uh, you know, we one of the shifts we, we look to take across all of our programs is that peace is something that we all have a responsibility to contribute to within our ability mm -hmm. and capacities. Whether that is simply looking at uh, 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 looking at systems, whether that's localised systems, being yourself or, or your immediate family or immediate community and what you can do uh, within uh, your family or immediate community to, uh, to shift the system uh, through that strengths-based approach to being more peaceful. So thank you for that question. I'll put a couple of links into the chat box and uh, hand back to, to Olivia. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so... I think getting back to the question you asked, Sasha, and just to refresh, we're talking about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on women and girls um, within our sphere of influence. Um, I think what I will, will say on that is, um, I think I, I see my kind of sphere of influence or uh, sphere of interest, I should put it as um, understanding those gendered experiences. So if I kind of rephrase it and say, well, how has COVID-19 impacted um, how we measure or how we understand the gendered experience, I would say it's had a very significant impact. Um, what we are seeing from initial data and initial reports coming from different countries is that the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately impacted women and girls. Um, and this may be uh, the case with increasing poverty rates um, disproportionately impact women. Um, as we've seen sharp increases in domestic violence as well, um, related to you know, more people staying at home and the associated factors. Um, so what I would say on that is, I think we've seen these very stark impacts, but I think going back to what Irene was saying before is the time is now to make the changes. And so my point would be the time is now to, for us to take a look at this crisis and what is happening and say, well, this, this is the time for us to find the better data and to make sure that we're uh, collecting better data and analysing it as such. Um, I think one of the key things that's come out to me in some of the initial data I've seen is that the access to reporting um, has been significantly impacted by COVID. So, for instance, in some countries um, in Latin America, we've seen a sharp decline in the number of official reported cases of family violence or sexual assault, domestic violence. Um, but what we can do is look at other sources of data to kind of help us understand why this trend has happened. And what we can look to is data from um, hotline calls, um, from women's uh, women's uh, call centers and that show us that 
the, the drop in trend in official reports we're seeing is because women aren't able to go to police stations to report these crimes. Um, and so I think, again, that makes the case that we really need to make it be making it easier for women to report instances of violence. Um, but just overall, I think it really has exposed that these existing data gaps are pretty harmful um, and can lead us to make the wrong conclusions if we're not cross-referencing cross-referencing the data we have with other data sources. Um, so again, I would just say that we need to take this as an opportunity to move forward and say, we really need to see who are the most vulnerable in society? Who do we need to help coming out of this crisis? And to do that, we need the better gender data to be able to make those decisions. Excellent. I think we have time for one last question. And I want to pose this to each person on the panel. If you could just take 30 seconds to answer this. What is your personal strategy to enhance women participation and ensure gender justice in your professional field and or public life in general? Um, I'll have a go at answering first. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think from my research perspective, um, my goal to make sure that women are being included is to conduct inclusive research. Um, it's to highlight these gaps and to advocate for the need to close them. Um, and I think in, you know, just in general, we've seen in the past few months, especially, I mean, I'm from the UK, so there's been a lot of discussion on um, gender justice in the UK. And I think one thing that's become apparent to me is the need for us to have these high level discussions. It's the need for us to work alongside one another to really get a better understanding of people's experience and particularly the experience of women and how that differs from place to place and why that might differ. Um, so I think these, these discussions are very important um, and making sure that they're heard and making sure that all women's voices are being, being heard in this sense. Mm -hmm. Me? Yes, if yes. everyone could just take a couple of uh, 30 seconds to address this last question. Yeah, well, I don't know, one minute. <laughs> um, <And> that's fine. <laughs> I had, I had a meeting with uh, tribal elders and there was one woman who came into the room and immediately she went to the side. She, the, the men came to the center and she came to the side. And I said, you come here, you're gonna sit beside me and you're gonna sit here the whole time that we're having a meeting. And when we have a picture taken, you're gonna be beside me. Um, you know, the, the whole thing of the oppression is so continuous in our in the heads of women. And that's where I want to work. I don't want to work with the, the person who oppresses. I'm going to work with the per person who is oppressed. And then to me, I believe that the way to, to bring about the change is to make the, that person empower herself and become political. This is the politics part. It becomes political. It becomes a a movement for change rather than asking the oppressor to change. I would, I would rather get the oppressed to change herself. Thank you. I'm happy to, to go next. Uh, and certainly, I guess the, question, the answer to that question for me is, is, is really informed by my, my past uh, uh, I did 35 years of uh, policing and you know, a good part of that policing career was um, uh, dealing with uh, the impacts of uh, domestic violence, family violence, sexual assault, actual assault and homicide. <laughs> uh, reality being that a uh, large percentage of homicides are uh, intimate partner uh, 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 events. So I guess, you know, bringing that into my, my now uh, uh, my role as a peace builder, I'm really informed by, by some of those creeds that have already been hinted at on today, you know, leaving no one behind. You know, Mary Anderson's uh, creed, do no harm. Uh, but I also, the other creed that I follow is that, that uh, you know, every day is a, is a school day, uh, always being open to, to new learning. Uh, and, and, uh, and really where I land is, you know, uh, which is sort of where Irene landed as well as, you know, looking at how to 
uh, uh, build strengths uh, within communities, within the individuals, uh, so all those creeds can be activated. Thank you. Thank you. Was there an order my internet cut out? Um, did you want me to go or is there an order we're going in? There's no order, you're up next. Okay. <laughs> Perfect, great. Um, yeah, so I would say, you know, Ma'am Inde, Irene Santiago said it very well in that, you know, hold another person up, bring them beside you. Don't let them be in the corner. Um, start a movement, don't do it alone change from the group of the people that are need the voice and start moving forward. And the other thing that I would say in the years of and so when I was younger, I was told that females didn't do this or that. Okay, fine. Then I went and did all those things and I worked really hard in the field. And then I was told, ah, you don't have a business degree. You can't analyze budget. So I went and got a business degree. <laughs> well, then I have the right credentials now, right? And so now as those things have happened, and I've had a voice at the table. Um, one of the things that I've said is, and it's in recent years as my voice goes stronger with female leaders like Irene Santiago to guide me, is I've actually said recently, thank you so much for letting me be at the table. Now I actually need you to move so you can leave. Like you don't need to be in this part of the table anymore. And most recently with my new portfolio, I've said, we don't need a table. We're going to sit in a circle. And so those are the kinds of things that as you gain a voice and you're upheld by other strong female leaders and males who support you, you get to say those things. But then my job is to reciprocate and always remember reciprocity. So my job now is to bring people Did I freeze or did Laura Lee freeze? Lorelei, are you were you finished? I think we froze for a second. Yes, if you it, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> if you heard me say reciprocity at the end, then you heard the end. Did everybody hear reciprocity? <laughs> we heard reciprocity. <laughs> Perfect. That that was it. <laughs> Thank you. You're quite welcome. I believe we did we get everyone? Absolutely. Okay, well, awesome. And, and I'd just like to say um, that with this wonderful um, panel of, of, of speakers we've had um, this morning, um, it's been a, a great privilege to be able to listen to all the uh, absolutely um, excellent, outstanding um, examples of how um, all women um, are able to, in their own way, be able to be catalysts for peace. And we've got women here as leaders and warriors and data gatherers. And women, I think, to me, represents the importance about how we um, can do this because we are also able to work um, together and we're always better together. And I think this important uh, 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 link of women who work together in partnership and also in, in solidarity to be able to continue those relationships of reciprocity and inter interdependence, which is, again, this way of systems thinking where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I think women, because they understand that as we are connected in this way, I think um, we are uh, capable and I believe there's a future that we will be able to transform change in the way in which um, our panel speakers were speaking about in relation to peace. Patricia, absolutely, I concur with that. And I, I would like to say that women are the key to the sustainable development goals. And with that said, I wanna thank everyone for their time. I wanna thank the panel again for sharing your expertise in your personal journey for women 
equality and gender equality and addressing the issues of gender data gap. At this time, I want to invite a host up, Mr. Ahmed Polat, who will give us the closing remarks. Thank you, thank you, Sasha. Once again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, distinguished viewers across the world, my newly extended families, uncles, aunties, cousins. I'm sure that you will agree today's inspiring, amazing speakers, inspiring, profoundly enlighten us with their remarkable presentations. With this opportunity, I would like to sincerely and deeply thank my cousin, Charlie, Patricia, my new cousin, Irene, Lorraine and Olivia. And special thanks must also go to my new cousin, Miss Sasha E. Butler for so generously and effectively facilitating today's discussion. I would like to also thank Ms. Jemre Ulker from the Journalist and Writers Foundation for her contributions. Finally, my big thanks to, uh, thanks to cousin Matthew for his ongoing technological support and assistance. Dear distinguished viewers, we are all in a constant and continuous state of promoting equality, diversity, justice, and empowerment women and girl for every individual, not only one day, but throughout the year. There is no doubt that we are aware of the economic, political, educational, and social contributions of women in our time and searches for solutions that can ensure true gender equality. The efforts indicate in this matter bring hope for the future. I hope that there will be a social system where women will have an equal access. No society can truly move forward if women who make half of its population are limited in their freedoms, rights, and opportunities. The way women are treated and the rights given to them are signs of where that society stands in terms of universal human values and the rule of law. Women's rights should be made part of the school curriculum so that the students will learn them early on. This is the only way to make the desired attitudes on women's rights to be internalized. People should make this attitude a part of their character. Education is the path to achieve that. Having said that, to grant every human being their deserved status goes through education. Elimination of poverty goes through education. Achieving social harmony and cooperation and the prevention of conflicts go through education. Bringing people together and reconciliation, enabling them to go arm in arm goes through education. The different approaches, visions, models, and the roots of each country and their circumstance and priorities should be used to enhance women's status. If we neglect to listen to women, we cannot improve public awareness in society. Women, women play a big role to establish peace in society. And I can say that women are the pillar of peace in every society in the world. On the occasion of this webinar, I reach one step closer to a world where the dignity of every human, especially women, is respected and everyone is treated equal. And I want everyone to work harder toward this goal. Affinity has proudly organized three wonderful webinars at the NGO CS, CSW65 Forum this year with val val uh, valuable partners and distinguished speakers. Today, we have successfully completed our third and final webinar. I hope all webinars have made great contributions to NGO CSW. We have had great opportunities to do these webinars at this platform, and I will definitely continue to support and encourage NGO CSW for future projects. Thank you for your time, and I hope to host you next year. Thank you. Bye-bye.